Um, I thought I would start with a, a when I was your age story, which I know irritates every young person anywhere in the world. So then I decided I would do that a little bit later when I got you guys on my side. Uh, the brief that was given to me was to talk about investing. Before I start doing that, I want to do a small dipstick survey. How many people present in this room are currently invested in anything? Mm -hmm. Bought a mutual fund, gold, real estate, anything at all? Okay, that's less than 10%. So let me start with what the numbers threw up. So research done by UBS shows that millennials today have the same approach towards investing as the World War II generation. Stunning, right? Part of this could be down to the fact that many of you were a witness to the big market collapse that happened in 2008, the job security issues that followed, the financial crisis. These were really the formative years for many of you. Now, sample this. There's a study by uh, Forbes, by UBS, I beg your pardon, that shows that 16% of millennials, that's the age group of 25 to 35, have $100,000 or more saved right now in their savings account. Just to translate that into our good old Indian currency, that is 65 lakhs or more than that. So that's really what's happening in terms of the other side of the story. So truth be told, I'm confused about what it is that millennials are up to when it comes to investing. I'm gonna try and move ahead, yeah. This is the one I was talking about. As you can see, 16% have $100,000 and nearly 47% have $15,000. So I don't know what it is that millennials are doing with their money exactly. Are you too cautious? Or is it that you're actually very smart about this? Um, unfortunately, there isn't enough proper data about the Indian context and what's happening in India with savings. But I think a good starting point to have this conversation about investing is that it's not about how financially savvy you are or how much money you have versus the other guy. Investing is giving yourself a voice. I was 17 when I started my first job. I worked in a small hole-in-the-wall television channel. So I would attend college all day, grab lunch, take a bus ride, then go to work, and then spend long hours doing very meaningful reports on issues like the importance of greeting cards on Valentine's Day. <laughs> I'm not trying to throw the hard work line at you. The line I'm trying to throw at you is the one about independence. Earning a living and being financially independent is the most exhilarating feeling in the world. Nothing compares. And if you had the opportunity to do that and also feed your dreams, wow. As a prototype Gen Xer or whatever it is that I am, part of the Fuddy Daddy set, my goals included a lot of the boring stuff, um, a home, a car, furniture, curtains, but that's not what it needs to be for you an amazing course you've been dying to study, a trip to see the Northern Lights, taking a break from work and figuring out what it is that you want to do and having something to tide you through that period financially, that's what investing could have the power to do. Just for fun, here's another graph also of how we spend as we save. As you can see, a lot of the stuff across generations is actually quite similar. And we do love to eat out. That's our favorite thing to do. Uh, I wonder, though, why we're all naturally disinclined to talk about investing or why we get intimidated when people start throwing financial jargon at us, risk appetite, growth-oriented, compounding, zing, zing, zing. But I think that I've slowly understood the problem or part of the problem. Before I talk about that, I want to talk a little bit with you about my other great love, which is education. So I spent the last few years educating myself, and I now spend time volunteering in a school, working with children who are dyslexic. That basically means reading and writing is very difficult. They also come from economically challenged backgrounds. 
double whammy. And here's my big problem with education. We spend 12 years in school, then we all herd like sheep into colleges, because that's what's expected of any self-respecting young Indian adult. And 15 years later, we are still completely and utterly unemployable. And that's because through our growing years, we're never really taught the skills we need as adults today. We have courses in calligraphy, in embroidery, all of which is great, but why isn't there a class on financial investing? This is a study done by Forbes, where 70% of millennials claim to have high financial knowledge, but only 8% of them could get all five answers on that financial literacy test correct. And that's what we need. Education needs to include conversations about financial investing. Something as simple as how I open a bank account. How do I work within a budget? Why is it important to save? This stuff isn't incidental. This is crucial for each and every one of us. And that's what we need to start talking about. So what am I doing at this prestigious talk with all of you besides making fun of calligraphy? <laughs> My experience in interacting with millennials is that uh, preaching is a very poor form of communication. So I'm going to put forth a few thoughts, something for you to think about after our interaction. Number one, technology. Millennials are drawn to technology. You guys have grown up around it far more than the generations before you. Use that. Use it to navigate the stuff that's difficult, whether it's digital wallets, buying a mutual fund, whatever. Make technology your best friend. Number two, lists are a good second best friend. This is your life. You get to decide how and what you want to spend on. But you do need to have a sense of your short-term and slightly longer-term goals. You need to jot that down. You need to have a sense of which way it is that you're heading. Number three, risk is a not-so-bad four-letter word. There are so many options out there about with regards to investing. Do your research, explore, understand, and then take that deep dive and go ahead and do it. In fact, I've been reading stats that show millennials have uh, caused or seen an explosion of interest in areas like cryptocurrencies and cannabis stocks. So I'm not judging. Go ahead. <laughs> Make your choices. Number four, like everything in life, it's OK to make mistakes. In the glory-soaked years of the stock market before 2008, my job involved commentating and reporting on what was a raging stock market. It was invincible, it defied gravity, it was permanent. So I took it upon me to preach to my best friend, whose interest in investing ranges from zero to nothing, about the importance of buying stocks. I went on and on and on. And after much enthusiastic prompting, she did it. She went and bought a whole bunch of stocks. A week later, a big company in the United States of America, Lehman Brothers, went bankrupt. And everything went to hell, led from the front by the stock market. <laughs> Did I get the timing wrong? Oh, yeah. Was I wrong about the idea of investing? I don't think so. And number five, investing, actually seeing your money grow is going to be boring and tedious and repetitive. For this, my only advice to you is to practice backward counting. And finally, here's what I think is the most powerful thing about investing. I often hear millennials being described as instant gratification seekers, very unsure, isolated, but you guys are also the generation that has produced a wealth of social innovators and entrepreneurs. 
A study by Deloitte shows that a majority of millennials refuse to compromise on their personal or family values and ultimately make or revoke investment decisions in companies based on whether they fall in line with those values, social, cultural, environmental. Simply put, you believe in the need to invest ethically. So I say this to you with the belief that you understand the emotion that I bring forth. Investing and wealth is in great measure about giving. Give to people you think you can help, to organizations whose work you admire and support. Give in whatever way you can, and do this especially for the women who work in your homes and offices. Teach them how to open a bank account. Show them how to use an ATM. Encourage them to save, because they're the individuals who will use that extra money towards a better education for their children, towards better health care. Give a teeny tiny part even of your earnings and savings to people who are so far back the economic curve, they cannot even begin to dream about the kind of lives you are living. I think what I've done today is quoted a lot of numbers and data around the idea of investing. But what I hope you take back from our interaction is the fact that investing is giving yourself a voice. And your voice matters. Thank you very much.